Now let's get right to our first session. As a reminder, you are welcome to post comments and questions in the YouTube chat window where you are viewing this live stream. We will try to address questions directly through the chat window and at the end of each session uh, by the presenters themselves. Also look for the feedback survey link at the end of each session. Teresa Hunsaker, one of our committee members from USU Extension Service will facilitate the first session. Teresa. Welcome everyone. Nice to have you on day two of our Be Ready webinar. Uh, it is my pleasure and I'm excited to introduce our first set of speakers to you today, Jonathan and Kyleen Jones. They are the authors of Provident Prepper, a common sense guide to preparing for emergencies. But they also teach self-reliance, emergency preparedness, and provident living on their website, theprovidentprepper.org, and their YouTube channel, The Provident Prepper. John and Kyleen invite everyone to join the ranks of the Provident Preppers and prepare for the challenges in the future. Thanks for being here with us today. And Jonathan and Kyleen, we'll turn it to you. Thank you for having you. us. Okay. Off is. we run. Today we're going to be talking about power outage preps. Prepare now to shine without electricity. So let's get started here. The first thing that we're always going to do is a risk evaluation. We want to understand what our risks are and how we need to take care of those risks. We need to think about special needs. We need to consider backup power options, um, lighting options, water storage and food storage. So those are the items that we're gonna talk about in this session. So let's just for a moment imagine some of the things that might happen. Now, of course, we had the Northern Utah power outage um, last fall, last September. Um, many of you probably were involved with that or, or at least aware of that. And then of course, Texas in the South just got pummeled by that solar, uh, the polar vortex and uh, lots of power loss there. And I think it's raised the importance of how are we going to deal with things if we, if we lose our power. Things like natural disasters could happen, man-made disasters, a pandemic, a severe pandemic could um, criti critically affect our infrastructure. Um, those extended power outages, we need to know how we're going to deal with them. And we were reminded of that just recently we had our own little power outage. Now it only lasted for about an hour, but it was a great time to reflect on, okay, what wasn't working, what was working, obviously our server. Okay, we, no, we were, this shows you how sick and demented we are because our power all of a sudden goes out and I'm like, oh, this is a wonderful opportunity. Get a list, let's write what, you know, and write it all down. And so this is coming from just a recent, okay, let's critically evaluate. If this stayed off for a long time, what are our problems and. Right, right. And so we didn't really have to get too much into the cooking or heating or cooling or refrigeration. No problems there. We did have some communication issues um, and we had some uh, ability to do our work was impacted. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and off we go. So the first thing that we need to consider in our planning, right? We've evaluated our risks, but now we really need to look at who we are preparing for. And many of us have special needs or have loved ones with special needs. And that is what we need to prepare for because quite frankly, a short-term power outage can be really a not big deal for many of us. And yet, if you have a loved one that is on oxygen and needs that to be able to survive, you had better have the backup power to be able to run the oxygen concentrator so that that loved one is okay. Right, and so we really want to look at our loved ones that have special needs and speak to that. Okay, so first of all, we're going to teach you all kinds of stuff, but be wise. Don't do stupid things. Don't blow up your neighbor trying to prepare for some unforeseen event because you're scared, right? Just sit back. We're going to carefully evaluate things. We want to store fuel, but we want to store it safely, and we want to make sure that we're safe today and don't do anything that's stupid. And I have no idea why I would have my boys on here and talking about doing stupid things. Hmm. Okay, there's a couple kind of outages that we wanna really look at. First, a mild weather outage, right? That's gonna be inconvenient and kind of an adventure time because what we're gonna do is move things outside, right? And we're just, we're just gonna be okay. 
Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot we need to prepare for, but it's not as critical as this power outage. Because if we are have a power outage in the dead of winter here in Utah, it is a potentially life-threatening situation, right? And that's what they found out in Texas, is that people were actually dying because they didn't have the ability to take care of themselves without power in the middle of this polar vortex. Um, our family, we do crazy things. And one of the things that we did was to turn off our power in the dead of winter just to see if we could survive it. And at that time, we actually had these little ones. And I'm going to just send you to some of the YouTube videos that we have. Our YouTube channel is The Provident Prepper, and we have literally hundreds of videos on there. But this one is goes through exactly what happened when we turned off our power and what we did to be able to survive it and the lessons that we learned. So that would be a really good thing um, to look at. And the other thing that's important is, are we talking about a short-term power outage or a long-term power outage? It's very different if you need to go without power for a couple of days than if you are looking at weeks or months or perhaps longer. Haha. <laughs> so we're gonna jump right into some backup power. You can see in this slide a portable power station and there's a lot of these out on the market there's a whole variety of brand names um, basically what they are is a big battery that will allow you to run not only charge your cell phone or your laptop or run this little thermoelectric cooler but also run household appliances um, and these come in a whole variety of sizes, all the way from about 100 watt hours up to 1300 watt hours. But this is something that you may want to consider that would allow you to run some important things. Um, one of the things that we need to do to understand that is to uh, know what, what needs we will be needing to run. So um, for instance, my list, right? If, if we have some kind of a long-term power outage, I want to be able to run my washing machine, I want to be able to run my Bosch to make bread, right? And I need my freezer and my refrigerator to work. Those are some of my basics. So when this little magic thing that he has, he calculates exactly what it's going to take to make sure that his wife's happy. So if this is something that appeals to you like it does an engineer, um, these little devices are available for $15 to $30 online or at, at the store. You can get this and you can put it on whatever device you're looking at. It will tell you how long you were running that device and how much energy it used. That allows you to plan. It allows you to know, okay, this is how much energy this needs. Then you can decide what you need to do from there. Um, I love all the little battery banks that are on the market today. Starting up there in the upper left, you can see just these small battery banks that will charge your phone. They'll charge my phone about five times. Um, really, really works out well. Uh, something that you can throw in your backpack if you're going camping or if you're just out on the road, it's a way for you to be able to have, to be able to charge your phone or some other minor things um, for a little, little bit of time. Uh, going down again, this uh, power station here, this one has about 1300 watt hours of energy in it. So we can run a variety of things. You're not gonna be able to do things like cooking or heating. Those kinds of things take immense amounts of energy, but but smaller things like medical equipment, and we'll get into that in a minute, um, this can help. Uh, in the center there, you can see an uninterruptible power supply that we have for our computer. Um, this has, as you can see on there, it says 79. It could run the loads that we have going for about 79 minutes, enough time that you can shut things down or it will automatically shut things down as that time uh, drops down. On the right-hand side there, you can see a couple of bigger power banks. These are capable of running homes, and these are usually tied to a solar uh, collection system. But these are just some of the opportunities that you have, depending on how extensive you want to go. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these things. This is a great example of um, some medical equipment that could be run by one of these portable power stations. This is an oxygen concentrator. Um, there's CPAP machines and other things that, that may need to be run. Uh, some of these will charge while you're using them. Some of those you can't use while you're charging them. You would charge them during the day and then use them at night. So you really need to know what you're looking for and make sure you get what you need 
to satisfy your uh, requirements. And one of the things when we went um, and took this photo um, is we were surprised how much power the oxygen concentrator really took. Right. Right. And so um, in order to run that for a long time, you're really going to need to be able to recharge this backup battery frequently. Right. And, and of course, these these power banks can be charged using household power when it's available. If it's on sporadically or whatever, you can do that. But normally you're going to have that charged and ready to go. And then you're going to charge it with some solar power. Now, this is just a small little solar suitcase, basically. Uh, this one is only 60 watts, but we can fold this out and you can see we're in a camping setting. We've got that power station and we're charging that um, in that in that format. And the other thing that you could do with this battery bank is while you're running the generator, you could actually be charging this. Right, right. Uh, this is another set of solar panels that we use to charge that power bank. Uh, you can see these are just on the south side of our home there and the cable goes in through the window. So we're, we leave the power station inside and then just use these to charge that up. Uh, this particular power station can uh, take in about 400 watts of energy. Uh, some of you may want to go with a larger solar power system. Uh, you can see here a, a ground mount system that would allow you to have those panels down on the ground. Um, that would be dangerous with our grandkids, but for some people Very. that would that would work out really well. And of course, you see a lot of rooftop solar around now. The thing that you need to consider when you look at rooftop solar is much of that, many of those systems aren't even going to be able to help you in a power outage. That is grid type energy that's going straight onto the grid. There are companies that you can work with that will provide um, you the opportunity to use some of that energy. Uh, our neighbor has the ability to use one plug. They get one plug that they can use during the day. And, and then if you wanted to add some battery storage, you could. But sometimes people think that this, all this rooftop solar, if, if I needed it, I could just plug into it. It's not quite that easy. And this is, again, that's grid tied power. So if you want something that can act as a backup system, you need to find a company and a product that will allow you to have not only grid tied power, but the ability to use some of that power as well. This is just another example of rooftop solar um, that you may want to consider. This is a, a unique little trailer here. This is a portable power trailer. This has the solar panels and battery storage. It also has a diesel generator in the event that you're say in the middle of winter and you're just not getting much solar, uh, that generator can kick on. It's got 130 gallons of diesel storage and it can charge the solar or charge the battery bank and help meet your needs. And of course, there's just the standard generator. These are great to have, but if you're going to have it, you need to make sure you have the fuel safely and legally stored so that you can run that. Remember, don't blow up your neighbor. That's the goal. Don't blow up yourself, but don't yeah. blow up your neighbor either. And you have to make sure this is used outside. Uh, there was a couple in Salt Lake a few years ago who had needed medical equipment run. They had their generator in their garage but the little gap where the cord came into the house um, allowed them to be asphyxiated. Uh, so you, this just has to be used outside. And again, if it's gonna be outside, it's gonna draw some attention. So, but whatever you use, make sure that you do it safely. We have a couple of videos there. You can see uh, Fuel Storage Life and Emergency Fuel Storage that talks about the importance of storing fuel correctly and legally. So just, just to kind of clarify it, if I do have a generator, I would be able to like plug in my refrigerator or my freezer and run for a couple hours, right? And then right. keep it turned off. So I wouldn't have to have this on for 24 hours a day in order to keep the food in my freezer cold. Right, right. You could, and you could be charging a portable power station with this at the same time for running other loads. And, and that's a great point. You could run this for a little bit. Um, they have electronic devices that you can put in your fridge or freezer that tells you the temperature. So you could just bring that temperature down to a safe level, then shut that off and then just monitor that to, uh, so that you're not running that generator all the time. That's a great point. 
All right, emergency lighting. Now it's interesting when our power went out the other day, um, that was the first thing that we had a problem with. I was amazed because it was daytime. What was it like nine o'clock in the morning or right. something? But it was a real grayish day outside. And we didn't, I mean, there was enough light to walk around, but there wasn't enough light to actually work because we both work from home. And so um, lighting is just really important. So when you're thinking about the power outage, it, there's some lighting requirements that you need to really think about. The first one is personal or task lighting, right? What are you gonna use this lighting for? Is it so that I can read a book or so that I have the ability to, to see what I'm doing? Is it area lighting, for, for instance, in this photo where they're playing cards around the table or where you're eating dinner and you need to light an area? This actually would have worked better if it was higher up. Um, and John did rig something for that to happen, but I'm like, oh no, 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 no. We're not putting that on there. Um, Hands-free lighting. A headlamp is a really good example of that. A headlamp can be really nice um, unless you're sitting here talking to somebody and annoying them with the light in their eyes, but that's another thing. And then flameless sources of light because they can be very, very dangerous. Um, duration of the need. Do you only need it for a couple hours? Do you need it for a couple of days? Will you need it for literally months? Um, or do you just not know, right? And kind of, we just don't know, but think about that in your planning and what you're planning for. Um, here are some examples of open flame. There are definitely lanterns and things that you can use too. In our little experiment where we turned off the power um, in the middle of winter, my original plan was to use lots of candles and we have lots of candles in my, our storage, don't get me wrong. But um, what we found was that the kids started sticking all kinds of things in there and lighting them on fire because open flame is fascinating. So make sure you understand, oh, and pets, pets can have a real problem with open flame too and getting into them. So make sure you understand who's around and who's going to be using this and make sure whether or not this is actually a safe consideration for you. And the other thing too, was that the light is very dim. It's not a bright, bright light. Now there are all kinds of battery powered options. Um, some with disposable batteries and some with rechargeable batteries, but that is definitely an option. But remember um, anything that has disposable batteries, the life on that is only as long as your supply of batteries lasts. And then chemical light sources like glow sticks. Now, these don't emit a lot of light and I don't think that they are the solution. But what I do think is that when you have children who are afraid because you know their world has been disrupted, man, you hand that child a glow stick and they feel safe and comforted and it, it's just an incredible blessing. So we always store glow sticks, um, and they're really inexpensive, right? It doesn't cost very much to, to purchase them, but we store them because as far as a comfort item, they're really good. Um, we have a video, and I'm sorry, we don't have the links. I wasn't well prepared for this, I guess, but um, we have a grid down lighting video. So if you go to our YouTube channel, it goes through a whole bunch of different lighting options and kind of gets a lot more in depth than we have the time or ability to do right here. Now, my very favorite lighting option is solar, hands down. I mean, we have some solar lanterns that we've had for like 10 years yeah. that are still <laughs> going strong. And we have kids and grandkids that are highly abusive. And quite frankly, one of the lanterns is missing a handle, right? It's, it, you can tell it's been really abused. Um, but the thing about solar is that I can keep them. Um, th do you see this desk here? I guess it's right behind me. You can probably see it. Behind those blinds, that is where I store these lights because they are constantly being charged. They're ready when I need them. Um, and like just this morning, I use that lantern and that task light, that really bright task light. It has like a little hook on the bottom um, to do a job under my desk with some of the cords. And so it's they're just really handy and really nice, but it also will charge my cell phone. That is one of the things um, that they were talking about a lot in Texas was people could not charge their cell phones. And yet a really simple device like this um, can both charge your cell phone as well as provide you with some light and anything that has a USB port, right? Um, hybrid lights are hands down my favorite because they're so durable. Um, and if you go to hybrid lights and you use the, pro or the promo code Provident, they give you 20% off. 
So that's something to think about. They are an investment. You could also pick up some of them at a place like Walmart will will sell some of the littler flashlights and they really do they are really sturdy and they last for a long time and there are other good solar lights out there too so this isn't the only kind this just happens to be my favorite okay let's talk a little bit about water storage um you may recall the people in texas that was one of the critical needs that they had they had water broken water lines they had people running out of water you resolve all that as you have your own stored water. You have clean water that you know is ready for your family to use. Uh, some of the things that we need water for, obvious drinking, hygiene purposes, first aid, sanitation, food preparation, and all of these things you can easily resolve if you just have some stored water. And if you think about this a little bit, this is a picture that came to us from uh, some friends in Texas um, who we were interacting with a lot of people down there and they had taken every container they could find out to get melt water off their roof, to get snow off the ground. They were doing what they could to capture water and, and have snow melt to take care of their needs. And if you have some advanced warning, certainly you wanna fill some containers. Now you need to do that safely. Obviously, if you have little children, you don't wanna fill up your bathtub and create a hazard there, but if you can fill up some containers and have that good clean water ready and available, that's a great thing to do. And you even might want to do that at the beginning of a power outage, right? Before there's a problem with the water, because it took a couple days, right, for the, the problem to happen. But um, so just think about that. Okay. And uh, how much water should we sure? We always recommend at least two gallons per person per day for at least two weeks. Now that may seem like a lot, but get started and do what you can do. I'm not a huge fan of bottled water, but water um, bottled water has its place. It's something you can grab and throw in the car if you need to. It's clean and ready to go. You can see the three barrel stack there on the left. Um, that would take care of our little family of three right now for almost a month. Um, so, and there's a variety of ways that you can do it. Some more expensive, some less expensive, but do what you can and have some water stored. Again, the bottled water, I'm not a huge fan, but it has its place. And we always have several cases on hand for this very need. If we have to throw them in the car, um, they are handy. And here we have some videos that you can look at. Uh, we have a series called the Newbie Preppers. Uh, people just getting started in the process because it can be overwhelming. And the need is to break it down into small pieces. And so we have a, a video series. It's not quite complete yet, but we're we're well on our way and we have one in there on water. We have emergency water storage. Um, just I really like that one because quite frankly, if you don't know anything about storing water for an emergency, that one will hold your hand and give you all kinds of different ideas and help you really get started with that. Right, right. And then best long-term treatment methods. This is mostly geared towards 55 gallon drums, which is what a lot of people use. But however you do it, just make sure you get it done. Also water filters. Um, I, I like to take any water that's coming out of storage and put it through a filter. If we're going to drink that water, it just freshens the water. It makes sure that it's ready to go. Or if you do run out of stored water, it gives you the opportunity to go out and filter water to make sure it is clean for you to use. Yeah, think about that, like Courtney and her family where they're catching the melted snow off the roof. Man, you would want to filter that water. And there, the video that's down there about emergency water filters. Okay, sometimes you walk in and you want to buy something, but it is the huge, this huge maze and it's really hard to know what to get. And so what this video does is it talks about the different kinds of water filters and what they do so that you can make a decision on what kind of water filter would best fit your needs. So definitely check that one out. Oh, okay, now food storage. Now, when you go out of power, when you have a power outage, one of the things that happened um, in Texas was that there was so much snow, they didn't have snow plows, people could not leave their homes to get um, food. And there were several times when um, one of our viewers actually told us that Walmart was out of food. Um, and so it's really important to keep a well-stocked pantry. Now, another one of our crazy challenges that we did was to go for 90 days without going to the grocery store or to fast food. 
And this was actually a whole lot harder than we thought it was going to be. Um, because, okay, and it turned out to be the fast food thing. And I didn't think we ate that much fast food, but culturally it was really hard. Now we did do this in a time of year when we had um, garden produce and that made a huge difference. But um, we have this whole huge series of videos that we did following what we did week by week. But it did, first of all, it gave me great confidence when the pandemic first started because I knew that even if we couldn't go to the store, we'd be okay for a little while, right? We had time until things settled down. Um, but our eating habits also changed. We ended up saving a lot of money, a lot of money, even after we restocked. Now, so what we recommend that you store specifically for a power outage um, are shelf stable foods, foods that don't require any refrigeration um, and everyday foods. Only store the foods that you and your family are gonna eat, right? Um, because it just makes sense. That way you'll keep these foods rotated. Make sure that they're easy to prepare. Things that you can just open the can and eat without cooking or things that you just need to add water. But now think about this. If you've stored like freeze dried foods for this and you need to add water, you need to take that into account in the amount of stored water that you have because you really need to to compensate for that. Um, we recommend you have a minimum, minimum of two weeks where you could be just fine without going to the store for two weeks. However, a better target is actually three months because that gives you, regardless of what the disaster is, it gives you a lot of time to be able to work on, you know, buys you time so you can find a different solution, right? And figure things out. And if you don't know how to do this, one of the videos that we have is on creating a three month supply. And in there, we've got several different of our friends who each do this a different way. There's not one right way. The only right way is your way as long as you are storing food. So power outage, it really doesn't have to be a problem. Um, we've seen cases where it has been a problem, but a little bit of preparation gets us to a place where it's not a problem. It can actually be a fun adventure. And that's, we've had a couple of those where, yeah, we just turn it into a fun adventure. Yeah. And we're talking about practicing, right? Because when we do these crazy challenges, um, it, okay, I'll admit it. I'm miserable through most of them and I complain. And sometimes I'm not a happy person. Yeah. See, Yeah. but by practicing, you learn where your holes are in your storage, where your holes are in your skills. And you develop this level of confidence that enables you to be able to survive whatever happens. And the other thing that we learned on our challenge that we didn't talk about that I should have actually is the importance of neighbors, the importance of community, because we, we really couldn't, we would have survived, but we couldn't have thrived without incredible neighbors. You know, my, our son went and milked somebody's cow in exchange for fresh fruits and vegetables. And that right? was one of the rules. We couldn't take yeah. donations. We had to barter. So if somebody came to us with something like chocolate, which, <laughs> which happened on so a regular, for me. we had to reciprocate in kale or something we had to with there had to be an even trade somehow who would trade chocolate for kale but seriously seriously one of my friends came with a bunch of chocolate and said i need some kale i have plenty of kale i just didn't have chocolate um but community when when something happens and the power goes out the first thing we want to do is check on our neighbors right we want to check on who needs help and make sure that they're okay. And even in our little power outage, that's one of the first things that we did. We got on the phone and we were checking on people that we knew had some issues that could be um, in danger, right? And made sure that they were taken care of because it's all about community. It's all about helping each other. So think Absolutely. about that in a power outage, bringing other people into your home if you have the ability to care for them, like they don't have power, they don't, well, nobody has power, but if they don't have heat, but you have alternative heating, oh, we'll all stay warmer together. Yeah. Yeah. So. We are huge proponents of community. So get to know your neighbors and know how you can help each other. It makes all the difference. And we've talked about this a little bit. So we go by the name, the Provident Preppers. We have our book that we have written and that's a great resource. Quite frankly, if you don't have much money, 
Um, about every six or seven months, our publisher will let us um, do the ebook for free. And so what we do is we put a video and say for the next three or four days, this book is free on Amazon and you can go get it. You don't have to, it's Kindle version, but you don't have to buy anything in order to do that. And it's our way of being able to share the wealth. So um, if you're in a position to buy it, great. If you're not, wait, when was the last time we did it? It was like Thanksgiving. So. so it should be coming up in a month or two. Um, so just kind of keep an eye on our, our um, YouTube channel because that's where we'll announce that because we want everybody to have that information. Um, and the YouTube channel is the Provident Prepper. Um, we have regular videos that we put out on there. Please um, watch them or share them with your neighbors that you think could benefit from this. We try really hard to um, be realistic in what we do and show you ways that you can prep for very little money um, and, and prep safely. And then there's our website, theprovidentprepper.org. Lots of really good information on there. So um, if you have a question about prepping, that's a really good resource. And one of the great things that I love about our website is the action plans. You can see it on there. The action plans, they wouldn't let us put them in the book because they were afraid they'd take up too much room, but that's fine. They're online. They are free. You can go on there. Now, we don't believe in giving you a list. We believe in throwing out some ideas, and that's what these action plans do. They throw out some ideas. They say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? It gives you a template to get going, and some of the stuff you're just going to cross off on there, and you're going to add some of your own things, and that's the way it should be. You need to design this for you, but those action plans are a great place to start and you can just go on there and print those out and make them work for you. Yeah. Okay. So as soon as I can figure out how to stop sharing, we are going to start answering questions. So this is super exciting, but I'm not quite sure how we're moderating this. Well, I will help with that process. Perfect. Um, Fantastic. As the questions come in, that's just great. Thank you so much, Kylene and John. We truly appreciate your insight information and, and constant updates for us through your um, web channels and or YouTube channels and websites and all of that kind of stuff. And, and stay tuned, the, you guys, because next yeah. hour we're doing heating and cooking. So I was just going to mention, and you guys <laughs> have to stay tuned for part two of the, the uh, workshop for us today. So one of the questions that just came through, and I've got one for you as well here in just a second when we don't have others, but um, you talked about preparing for medical needs in a power outage. So what are your recommendations for someone with in, insulin dependency, which needs to have that kept cold? And how do you do that in long-term power outages? Oh, long. Okay, so um, if you remember back on the slide that has the battery bank, next to it was a cooler. That's actually right. a little refrigerator right. um, that can be run off the battery bank. And you would have to charge that battery bank regularly. Solar's gonna be your best bet, but yeah, that, it's a little, go ahead and tell them more about the little refrigerator. Sure, yeah, that's just a thermoelectric and those are available out there on the market. They're not very expensive. That would be one way to do it. If you want to have a little bit larger system, you could have just a little mini fridge that it could run. Um, so you can scale this to the size that you need, but, but that is a challenging issue. Uh, the need for refrigerate, refrigerated medications. And um, so that would be one thing that you would want to focus on. Okay, what, what, it is, what is it that I would need to do? And you know, if, if you want to contact us with more details, we'd be happy to help with that. But find a system that will work that you can use. You would need to know how much energy whatever device was going to take um, and then size the system so that you could make sure that need was met. But solar is a great way to do that. I really like, you know, the solar. If you have the ability to do one of the little small um, inverter generators, Honda makes a great one and there's other great ones out on the market. Um, and that way, if, if we are in the middle of winter and you've had cloudy skies for a week and you just don't have energy left, then you can kick on that generator. You can use it to charge that power bank and to run their fridge or whatever you need to help make sure that uh, you can get through that. A couple of thoughts. First, the best way to contact us is on the providentprepper.org scroll all the way back down and there's a contact us page just 
send us a message and it'll give us your email and we will reply back. John knows a lot about this kind of stuff. And so if it's not your area of expertise, it, it's a good resource for you. Um, the other thing that I would say is figure out your neighbors. Do you have a geek neighbor like us that's gonna have power that would let you charge your battery bank using some of our um, alternative power? Because sometimes we're on a budget, right? And that, that little battery bank is all we can afford. Um, and so, you know, look at your resources because, you know, it's all about community. We need to help each other out. So, and I'm sure there are things that you could contribute to whoever it is that's sure. providing that power for you. Um, that would be a blessing to them too. And maybe they could store that medicine. Um, if, if they have the yeah, ability to do that, they could store that medicine. Um, but, but you're doing the important thing right now is, is thinking about these things and figuring them out. In the middle of a crisis is not the time to be yeah. trying to figure these things out. So way to go. Good, good words of advice. I, I wanna come back to one of the things that you mentioned on the cooler, you call it a thermal? Thermoelectric cooler. Thermoelectric, okay, great. Yeah. All right, another question, they're coming in. Good. Um, should someone be concerned with the type of plastic for their water storage? like the recycle symbol number and are there certain numbers that are better to look for than others okay so there is perfect right if i could have the wish of my heart i love the water prepared tanks right they are ideal they are 500 bucks a piece and if your budget can handle that that's fantastic however uh, most of us can't afford something like that. And so we might be doing things like refilling soda bottles. You're never gonna refill a metal or a milk jug because there's bacteria in there. But one of the videos that we have talks about how to clean those out so that they're safe. And um, some people tell you not to store water in them, but they've had soda in them, right? They are intended for edible um, beverages. So that's what I would say, yeah, in a perfect world, I'd store everything in glass, right? Because there wouldn't be an earthquake and I wouldn't have any funds to worry about. Um, but there, I would definitely stick with peat bottles that have held um, edible substances only. And it's HDPE. HDPE. Yeah. HDPE um, is another plastic that has held edible substances only and clean them out really, really well. And that's a great point. Never use anything that you don't know what was in it before, yeah. or it had something that could be toxic. It's got to be food grade, and it's got to have held. If it's if it isn't new, it needs to have held something that is safe, some kind of food product or or drink base or whatever. Yeah. But it has to it has to be safe. And be prepared right. to filter it. Right? If you have a really good filter that filters out things like chlorine wow it's going to filter out the plastic too right so you won't have to worry about that filters can be expensive right but um and like i said look at that video that we did on filters or contact us we are so happy to answer your questions because this this for us is kind of a mission we want to help our friends and neighbors and community be prepared because together we'll survive anything thank you that leads to another question almost perfectly and when you were talking about the filtration um this one is from a gentleman by the name of John. He says, can I store and use water from the city's secondary source? And I would suspect going on your comment a second ago that if I were filtering it, um, if I had access to it, if it wasn't contaminated per se, I mean, it's not clean, but what are your My thoughts question on that? is, why would, why would you want to do that? Well, I because can't answer why he asked it. <laughs> yeah, the, the secondary source is just, yeah. problematic typically they are clean but they're not going to be as clean they're not treated water um, if that's what you had to use if if you were in the middle of a crisis and you could get that water yeah i would treat it with uh, chlorine calcium hypochlorite is our favorite and then use a filter to make sure that that is polished and clean but i think um, his question was about storing it wasn't right. the question about storing it, says, it? yeah it was, store you and store use. and use and use okay um yeah. and so yeah I, You'd, you'd be best to use your city supply. Um, and when I put that into our storage, if it's chlorinated, I don't even add another um, treatment to it because it does have residual chlorine that, um, and if it's going into a, a thoroughly clean vessel and it's clean water that's still got some residual in it, you're fine. Um, 
The secondary water, I would be a little bit concerned about, but having water is better than not having water. And if you've got water, then you have options and you can clean it up. So we walk, Maybe. when we take our walks, we walk up to a pond that is used for the secondary water. I wouldn't want to drink it. I just wouldn't want to drink it. Maybe for external use only on a day where I'd been in the mud. Yeah. Or, or I go. would filter it. Yeah. 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 Um, Good question. Another question. Yeah, great questions. Another question that I have is that's come through is if I have a water delivery service, that's the water dispenser, can I use those containers for long term water storage? Yes and no. Do you know, is it eight uses? I don't. Okay, I can't remember, but we went um, up to Salt Lake and got some of those um, that they were throwing away the, um, is it Olympic? water yeah the anyway, water cooler and bottles. and we learned because we wanted them so we could cut off the bottom and use them over our tomatoes and our peppers um to be able to grow them right and and so that was a really good idea well we learned that they only use them i can't remember it's like five to eight uses before they can't use them anymore does it break down maybe or go brittle I'm, or? I'm, I'm wondering if that's it but quite frankly it's a good quality bottle i would have absolutely no problem storing them sealed i i wouldn't have an issue okay. so i can't really answer that question other than what i wouldn't do or what i would do so. again having water is better than not so yeah yeah and we're looking into for sure yeah yeah here's another one i have an individual in our family who several times a day uses the net that uses electricity we have a small nib that can run off of a car, but it's quite small. So their question is suggestions for generators, solar, natural gas. You We're know talking that. about a nebulizer, right? Right. Okay, because our, our son used a nebulizer a lot. I don't know what the power dot is on that. That's not going to be huge. Not very much. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're not going to use much. These little power stations that we've talked yeah, about the battery bank. would just do a really good job mm -hmm. with that. That would be a great use for it. You know, in addition to like the CPAP or the, the oxygen concentrator, and again, you need to to know what that is going to require, and and make sure you size your little system for that. But they're such a great little technology. Uh, they're mostly light. Um, of course, the the larger the capacity, they get a little heavy, but uh, but they're light. They're portable, and they just do amazing things. It's it's a great technology. Oh, this is great. You guys have given us so many good ideas and especially for medical uh, necessity kinds of things like the I insulin or the nebulizer. Important. Yeah, important for us to consider. I don't see any last minute questions coming in. Any final comments from you as we finish up before we move into part two? Just keep making progress. Yeah. The fact that you're here today says that you would rather be here than outside in the beautiful sunshine. So you're doing the right things. Says you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep making steps. Sometimes it can be overwhelming and, and we get that a lot. People say, I don't even know where to start. And that's why we developed the action plans in the book to break it down step by step. And you, you're not going to get it all done at once. And sometimes that bothers people. They want, but it's just a step by step thing. And everything that you do improves how you're going to be able to handle some kind of a crisis when it arises. So it's one step after another and you get there faster than you think you will. And you look at all these people that are working so hard to present this conference for us, right? Um, but there's only so many of them and they can't take care of you. And the, there just isn't enough ability out there. We need to be responsible for ourselves so that we can learn from them and then help each other out. And, and so thanks for being part of the solution, guys. Yeah, we appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Hey, I did just have one last question come in okay. and this will be our last one before we uh, take a short break. This one is, I'm thinking about storing city secondary water in stack of blue 55 gallon water bar barrels, and then if and when needed, filter it through the big Berkey, which, you know, uh, is, is that a viable option? Did he say why he's gonna store secondary instead of um, city water? No, nope, still, still isn't indicating. So, okay. Personally, I would treat that water when I store it. Would you? I so. probably would, and then and then treat it on the back end as well. But um, and why the, would you treat it on the, the back end? 
Well, or would you just filter I just, it on the back end? Back I just end? always filter it on the back end. But not necessarily treat filter it. Uh, yeah, that would okay. probably be fine. Um, and he's I'm not he's sure what it is. Oh, looks like he's, it looks like he's going to be using that slow drip, the big Berkey, you know, the standard, right, the yeah. gravity filter uh -huh. yeah. that'll do lots at a time, but slow. The Berkey is fabulous, right? Yeah. It is like the Cadillac of water filters. And yeah. we have a few of them actually. Um, and I, I think they're awesome. Yeah. First choice would be to use good city water. Secondary water would be second. I'm not sure what it means. The stack of blue barrels. Um, just be careful, they're very heavy. Um, and I'm not sure how well they would stack on top of each other, but um, but certainly, yeah, having having that water is such a blessing. Um, so make sure that you have water and, uh, and that you know how to take care of that. One thing that I would also think about is when I store my water, I know you totally have the option to treat it when you store it or before you drink it, right? Um, but what if I don't have that big Berkey when I need to use it? What if something's happened and I can't filter it? Do I have the best water that I can have without anything else? I'm hoping I have the Berkey, right? That's why we have a few different filters so that, you know, we can have something, but hmm, just, yeah. a, just a thought. Yeah, yeah. Just a and, thought. and good good comments for them to think about as they make the consideration for themselves. So thank you. And you guys are awesome. Absolutely. Water storage. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, yep. we need it. definitely need it. All right, guys, we'll give you a short break. John and Kylene, we'll see you back here. Wade, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, John, John and Kylene. And yes, uh, thank you, uh, our participants for all those great questions as well. Keep those coming in. Um, so yes, we are in a break, but we are going to have a a little commercial here before we go into that break yeah look in the look in the chat window there on the youtube channel for the um feedback form the survey form if you'll please take a moment to fill that out after each of the sessions that you attend we'd like to get that uh, your feedback on on our sessions uh and and then um we will have an overall feedback form for you at the end of the end of the day today so um we look forward to and you'll uh, be entered into a prize if you to win a prize if you um, a prize drawing if you'll complete that final overall form as well at the end of the day so take a second to fill that out uh we uh, again as Teresa said we'll have a break until two o'clock at the top of the hour so we do have a couple of um uh promotional videos for you again from our uh, sponsors here i think this first one is from the rocky mountain center for occupational health and safety we appreciate their sponsorship brian are you a frontline worker who works closely with the public? You could receive up to $400 compensation and free weekly COVID-19 testing for participating in a CDC Recover study. Email, call, or visit our website right now to learn more and apply. All right, well, we will uh, continue again at 2 o'clock, so please, uh, please uh, rejoin us at 2 o'clock. Just a reminder, uh, the remainder of our sessions later today at two o'clock, we will continue our long-term power outage presentation. At three o'clock, we will be talking about earthquake preparedness uh, and a home hazard hunt, how to make our homes more safe, safer in an earthquake. And then at four o'clock, a presentation, important documents and financial preparedness. So you wanna make sure you uh, stay tuned with us and uh, join those sessions as well. Uh, I cannot take this social distancing anymore. It's driving me crazy. Uh, how are you holding up, my friend? Tell the truth. I'm dying of monotony. <laughs> you know, in our house, we have been practicing our family emergency plans. <laughs> no, really. It's a great time to do it. I mean, we're all home, right? And so we've been dipping into our food storage and we've been practicing new recipes and We've even found a few we like. And I've learned to make bread. It makes our house smell so good. And I learned to make it from scratch. Huh, I should do that.
Thank you, Brian and Jeff, for that excellent uh, public service announcement. Be ready, Utah commercials. Anytime is a good time to talk about emergency preparedness. Uh, those videos, by the way, are available to view on our Be Ready Utah YouTube channel, along with uh, previous sessions or sessions from previous uh, webinars. The Be Ready Utah webinar we held in November, those sessions are available on the YouTube channel. And sessions from yesterday's Be Ready Utah webinar, day one of this webinar, if you missed yesterday, those videos are also available on the Be Ready Utah YouTube channel. So please uh, check that out sometime, youtube.com slash Be Ready Utah. Um, we are just uh, under two minutes away before our next session. So thank you for being with us today. Did you hear about all that flooding going on? Yeah, sounds pretty bad. I, I hope it doesn't happen here. It could. Did you know homeowner's insurance doesn't cover flooding? Really? Yeah. So we're going to get it. It'll take 30 days to take effect. Huh. I should do that. <laughs>